Oh, go ahead. Okay, if you want to call in, folks, the telephone number here is 707-937-5103. I repeat, 707-937-5103. Pick up your phone, call in, ask Dr. Holly. Here's an opportunity to get a free psychiatric consult. (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, it's not free, Richard. I'm going to be sending everyone a bill. Okay, well, you will be billed, but since yes. we... Okay, it'll be uh, coming through the Internet. Um, you mentioned in your book... This is something I've wanted to t- sort of tease you about in reading in the book. In one, uh, two pages that I looked at, just just two pages with the book open, you used the word horny four times. Really? Yeah, and throughout the book you use the word. You love that word, horny. Okay. And, and so I think the, the, the ideology of that word must come from the male phallus standing up erect and looking like a horn. Right. You use it about women. So are okay. you, uh, one, uh, do you, is that a way of saying that since the clitoris gets engorged with blood during sexual excitation, that's a kind of little horn, and women are horny that way. Or uh, what? Talk right. to us a little about the clitoris and the place of it in human sexuality, please. Look, there, there aren't that many great words for women being aroused. I mean, you know, libidinous is is a little bit unwieldy. I heard a great word recently, a, a phrase which was ladywood, which really ladywood, <laughs> very good, it was very funny. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I'm sorry to hear that it was that I redundantly used any word because I really I don't want to. Well, it wasn't overly redundant. It was just sort of interesting because it kept bringing my attention yeah. to you know kind of gender uh, based uh, philosophy of you know are we calling the clitoris you know that's an argument that's going on for a hundred years since Freud are we calling the clitoris a little penis and you know or not and et cetera et cetera. Well, it's not that little. You know, one of the things I talk about in Moody Bitches is the clitoris is actually a lot bigger than anybody realizes. <laughs> You're just seeing the external nub. The clitoris has has internal legs um, that can go to between six and nine millimeters. So it, I'm centimeters. So it, um, we we hide most of our erectile tissue inside our bodies, women. The little external nub you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg, not. Literally. Well, if you're saying it goes up to nine millimeters, there's two point five four uh, centimeter uh, centimeters in, in an inch. You're talking about a clitoris that's three inches long. Now, that's not no, that's no longer um, a not little nothing. tiny tip yeah. of an iceberg. Said, I would encourage you and all your listeners to do a Google search on the three dimensional size of a clitoris, and you will see that it is a very complicated organ. It's not just this little external nub. It goes internally and it surrounds the urethra and it surrounds the the bottom of the vagina it's a large internal organ that gets engorged um just as a man's phallus gets engorged so there's a a lot of area that's available for excitation and stimulation and and sexual pleasure yeah i've i've got you know i talk quite a bit about sex as you figured out in moody bitches and there's a great chapter on on sex and, you know, why women have so much trouble climaxing and how to make it easier, um, that I think is very helpful. And I also think it's a really good book for men to read. I mean, first of all, the, the sex chapter would be great for men to read because it would help their partners. Um, but I, also I want to underline that and say definitely I agree that it would be it's an important chapter for men to read. With one exception, I want to take one exception to it, uh, okay. which is... You, you advocate in, in several uh, different uh, areas of your book where you say you should, you, know, talk, you talk about weekly sex. And I'd like to know why aren't you advocating daily sex? Well, look, for some women, weekly is already a pretty big jump. I, I don't have any problem with daily sex, but most women don't want to have sex every day. Men want to have sex every day. And there's a big, this is one of the things I talk about in the sex chapter is that, is that Partners need to be honest about what their desires regarding frequency are because there's going to be a really big discrepancy yeah. with what a woman thinks is okay and what a man thinks is okay. And there are a lot of men who feel like they need to ejaculate every day. And that's fine. But many women do not want to have sex every single day. It's just not, uh, you know, they're tired. It's an, it's, they're not, tired because they're all exhausted and stressed out and working and coming home, taking care of the kids, and then doing the dishes and falling apart. I, I right. want to take a call here. We promised we would, so l- let's okay. see if we can do that. Michael, please. Hi, welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. You're on the air. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, a dreaming. I was dreaming before I got on antidepressants. 
and um, I went off, and now I can't dream. Thank you. That's fascinating. What do you make of that, Julie? Well, first of all, the thing to keep in mind is that there's dreaming and there's remembering dreaming, and those are two very different things. So it may be that you're dreaming and you don't remember dreaming. And one of the things, actually, that controls whether you remember dreaming or not is the cannabinoid system. And if people... Uh, people who smoke pot regularly or smoke before bed tend to not remember their dreams as much as people who aren't smoking. And one thing I hear from my patients who are pot smokers is that when they stop smoking pot, they start dreaming like crazy. But I have to say that I actually haven't heard too much from patients about the change in dream frequency with antidepressants. It's more of something I've heard about in relation to smoking pot or quitting smoking pot. So, you know, the question is, is she dreaming or is she not remembering her dream? And also, is she using any cannabis? That's an important one. I hope you all heard that, folks. Dr. Holland is saying that if you're using cannabis, then there, it's a higher percentage of you will not be remembering your dream. It doesn't mean you're not having them, but you won't be remembering them. Let's take another call. That last one was a great call. Hi, welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. You're on the air. Yes. Yes. Hi, I was wondering about... Uh, Lexapro, Wellbutrin, and Geodin. I have a girlfriend that um, takes all those for bipolar mania or, or schizophrenia. And she's also going through menopause. Thank right. you very much. That's, that's a great so question. It is an important question. Perimenopause, which is the period leading up to when the period stops. You know, menopause is one day. It's the one-year anniversary of when your period stopped. But there's like a seven-year period leading up to period stopping and maybe six or seven years on the other end of your period stopping, that makes up the 14 years of perimenopausal symptoms. And a lot of those symptoms are primarily psychiatric, and they're related to mood, insomnia, appetite. They look like depression. Women who've never seen a psychiatrist will show up at a psychiatrist's office during this perimenopausal phase. It's the most popular time for a woman to see a psychiatrist or to see a GP about psychiatric complaints. So the problem here, first of all, you say, you know, maybe she's got bipolar, maybe she has schizophrenia. That means she needs a psychiatrist because those are two very different diagnoses which are treated with very different medicines. Now, if you're asking about Lexapro and Wellbutrin, that is a combination that I use quite a bit in my office. Um, it's, you know, the side effects of one sort of cancel out the side effects of the other, and between the two of them, they make a very solid antidepressant. The Geodon is an antipsychotic, which is being used as a mood stabilizer. But the question is, are these just natural hormonal fluctuations that are affecting her energy level and her mood, and does she have schizophrenia, does she have bipolar disorder, or does she have severe perimenopausal symptoms that would actually do better if she were addressing them hormonally and seeing an endocrinologist or a gynecologist to treat the hormonal fluctuations? Truly, before, we have about uh, three minutes left, and I want to uh, ask you to talk a little bit about female selection of males and what you call cads and dads. Right. So uh, the, way, the way that we go about mate selection has a lot to do with where we are in our fertility cycle. And if you're on the pill, you're not going to have a cycle, so your, your mate selection is going to be completely skewed. But um, when women are fertile, they're more likely to choose uh, chiseled men who are, have high testosterone, low voices, very masculine, kind of alpha males. When they're not fertile, they're more likely to choose men who may be um, good at staying home and helping with the kids or sharing what they have. Uh, so there's this idea of a cad, which is like an alpha male, kind of a tough guy, motorcycle jacket, leather, you know, um, scruffy beard, like he's very macho and manly, and you're attracted to that because you want the, the, the sort of highest quality sperm that you can get when you're fertile. But the rest of the time, you're looking for non-genetic materials that can be shared, so you want someone who's more like a dad. So when you're on the pill, you choose dads more than cads. And when you're fertile, you choose cads when you're fertile, and dads during the rest of the time when you're not fertile. Oh, there's something scary about what you're saying here, Julie. I mean, it sounds like the, the guy that you want to be with is not the guy you want to have a lot of fun with, and vice versa. I mean, how do you work this out? You need two husbands. Well, see that, well, now this gets into an issue that I talk quite a bit about in, in Moody Bitches, which is the issue of monogamy not actually being natural for our species. 
And, you know, a lot of women who are paired with someone who is a good provider and a good father, when they are fertile, they still may find that they're attracted to an alpha male if one is available. Um, and it may not be, you know, the person that they've vowed to stay committed to. So the other thing about the pill is that it deranges your pheromone processing. You know, the way that we choose mates is, is largely based on scent. And the, the reason that it's based on scent is that the, the pheromones and the scent carry information about, about genetic susceptibility. So if I'm, if I'm resistant to five illnesses and I meet a guy who's resistant to five other illnesses, then between the two of us, our kids are going to be resistant to ten illnesses. Mm-hmm. That's a good match. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I'm not on the pill and I smell him, I, you know, I take in his pheromones, it helps me to figure out that he's a good match. But when you are on the pill, you end up pe- choosing people who are more genetically similar so that you know, maybe they're, they're resistant to the same five things you are. Um, that you end up choosing what's called a brother instead of an other, somebody who's much more genetically similar. And if you come off the pill, sometimes you discover that you don't like the way that your partner smells. So I actually encourage my, my patients who are really ready to settle down and have a baby and are really looking for a mate that they get off the pill um, and use non-hormonal birth control, which I know is inconvenient, um, but I think it's, it's a better way to choose a mate. And then you've got really interesting issues, Richard, about how um, SSRIs, the serotonergic antidepressants, affect mating behavior, that because women are less horny, because it's harder for them to climax, and because they're sort of blasé and complacent and think everything is fine, they don't have the same behaviors around attracting a mate um, or becoming obsessively in love with a mate because their brain chemistry is totally different. You know, when you're in love with someone, you're actually in a low serotonin state where you're obsessing about them and you need them and you have a lot of angst around them and it's easy for you to climax with them. But when you're taking SSRIs, you've got the exact opposite. And That's, we got to st- stop you right there. When you, I'm sorry, Julie, we're running out of time. I beg your okay. pardon. Don't mean to be rude. Uh, but if you heard that, that last sentence, when you're taking SSRIs, you're in a very different kind of psychophysical condition. Julie, I want to thank you so much for the privilege of, uh, of interviewing you. It's been a great honor, really. I'm a fan of yours, and I hope you'll make time in your extremely busy schedule so that I can interview you on the ecstasy book and the pot book. Maybe we could do the two of them together if you'd be willing sometime in the future. We should do that, Richard. Sounds like a good idea. Thank you. I would love to. Yeah, it's been a terrific uh, experience interviewing you. And uh, I hope everybody who's listening has enjoyed. The book is Moody Bitches by Dr. Julie Holland. You want to look it up on Google and get a copy. And you guys, you want to read that chapter on sex. It's going to improve your sex life, I promise. And so thank you for listening to today's broadcast of Mind, Body, Health, and Health and Politics, which is made possible by our KZYX staff and our in-studio engineer, my dear friend Mike Delora. Please join me again in exactly two weeks at 9 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Until then, this is Dr. Richard Miller reminding you that good health is worth fighting for, fighting for, and it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of...